I tell you what, Liz, sometimes yes. things work out for a reason. Now, mm -hmm. the reason I'm saying this is because I know there's a gentleman backstage that just clocked in the second I started the show. <laughs> oh, yeah. And it's the gentleman we all came to talk to. Oh, my there goodness. he is. Hey. Is he? Wow. Rick, it's, it's funny, Rick, because not only is Sean sick, but oh, I wasn't sure if you were gonna you got the right link. So I we didn't were, get a, I didn't get any link. I've been sitting here for 15 minutes in a hundred degree bedroom waiting for someone to say something to me. So I sent you the link. You just got it when I sent it to you. Yeah. Yeah. Just now. Yeah. So there you go, Liz. We, listen. I, so I'm not the regular guest. I apologize. Sean Wagner is sick and he's home with the with the flu. But I assumed that he had sent you the link. So I got it from Liz and I resent it to you. That's why I said tonight's link. So right when we started the intro, pops up Rick, Rick McCallum. So ladies and gentlemen, author, ghost hunter, and fucking the badass stuntman Rick McCallum. Rick, where you are you are you still in LA right now? Am I still in LA? Yeah. Yes. Can't tell by my background though, can you? No, that's no. what that's <laughs> figured you're somewhere in Ibiza or or Italy. Uh, yeah. Come on, man. <laughs> Scotland. <laughs> Look at the hat. Check out the shirt. These are clues. That I'm is... I'm not the regular host of this, so I'm going to turn it over to Liz, to Liz because Liz is our beautiful co-host for the regular show, and she's got a bunch of questions to ask you, and I'm just going to ride co-pilot. But you've been doing a good job. Thank well, you. That actually, I, behind, that actually behind me is uh, Edinburgh, Scotland. There you go. Well, it's beautiful. <laughs> Anything that detracts from me, I'm in favor of. I don't know. I think you're pretty cute, too. Oh, there you go. Watch, watch out. Wait, watch out. Like this now. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> so how are you? Uh, doing pretty well. Just had a uh, ghost hunt at the uh, Glen Tavern Inn on Monday night, uh, which was actually really good. Uh, it was okay. a live stream, and mm -hmm. I'm leaving tomorrow morning for Old Paulding Jail in Ohio. And then wow. the following Saturday, I'm leaving for Scotland for a month. Lucky Hence the t-shirt. Yeah. I wear my t-shirt, my Scotland shirt all the time. I'm just <laughs> hoping some Scottish lass takes a liking to me and takes me with her. <laughs> Uh, it's funny. I used to work. I tour. I did the tour managing thing with bands, and I had a little Scottish. You're from LA. You might know Ruff. I know he's a little Scottish guitar tech, and he was like, "If it ain't Scottish, it's crap." And he had the little square head. He was he was one of my best friends. He's and he was Scottish. He probably still is. No, well, he's still one of my best friends, and I'm <laughs> sure he's still Scottish. <laughs> You don't get to change your nationality. I don't care what anybody says. If you're Scottish, <laughs> you ought to stuck with it. <laughs> so uh, I was talking to Liz before we get started. Let's for people that don't know you, and we got a lot of people clocking in by our accords. Um, give us the 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 mile high Rick McCallum story, right? Let's give give us the book without the book. Like, uh, how did you get where you're at? Uh, just keep plugging along. You know, I actually. Uh, I've been ghost hunting for almost all my life. And as you can tell, uh, this is not paint. So it's been quite a while. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, I was in the movie business for 40 years, you know, falling down the stairs and getting blown up and stuff like that. And I'd been doing a movie in, in Mansfield Prison with Kane Hodder, the guy who plays Jason Voorhees, mm -hmm. and uh, Ari Mihailov, who plays Leatherface in Texas Chainsaw Massacre 3. And, you know, we just decided to ghost hunt one night and, you know, because I'd always been doing it. And I didn't know that Kane liked it. And we found out that, you know, we had a lot in common as far as ghost hunting and we started our own group. And we got to go to quite a few places, but now we're not getting to go as much because, first off, Kane does a lot of movies. Mm -hmm. uh, so does R.A. And both of them moved from Southern California to different states. So it's, you know, getting kind of hard for us to uh, get together very often, but we will. As soon as we find something fa fascinating, we're going to jump on it. And me, I mean, look, uh, I'm the non-famous one of the group, and I'm going to be gone for a month. So, I mean, it's <laughs> you know, that, that's just the, the way it is. So, well, I saw somebody up there put up Hatchet. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We, we have all sorts of, of – there we go, Hatchet right there. And we have uh, the face – I'm usually I'm just the producer. I'm backstage putting this shit up. 
but now I'm kind of being on there and, and stuff like that. So, so yeah, you've, I mean, I just watched the A team, the original TV show, right? Not the movie. And those guys used to roll the fucking vehicles all. We can swear here. We used to roll the vehicles over. I mean, you, you've been in Hollywood doing stunts for, for how long? Since 1982. Right. Right. So you've done some. Uh, let's talk about that. Let's talk about how amazing the stunt community was back then before CGI. Well, it was uh, a lot smaller, number one. Uh, there weren't one-tenth of the guys that we have now. Uh, it was more of a closed thing. Now there's probably 10,000 stunt guys across the nation. Um, back then there was probably like 250, 300. So, um, yeah, we, we have done some stuff that uh, is very interesting. Do you, do you remember the movie Footloose? Yeah, of course. Do you remember when uh, Laurie Singer was standing between the two cars? Well, Kane and I had to recreate that for a movie, and we actually went 42 miles an hour around curves with this girl standing in our car. Oh, that's right. Yes. Yeah. yeah so that 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 was something that was uh, nerve wracking, and you know, but you know, we never touched cars one time, and we did it probably 15 to 20 times because of the coverages. You know, the different angles, and right. and the girl actually played two different people, so she had to get out of wardrobe, get in another <laughs> outfit, and get up there. So. Uh, yeah, that was that was one of the scary ones for me. You know, um, I've done a lot of stuff where I've just beat the living hell out of myself. I would Kane imagine. Has, I would imagine that. As well. well, I did one um, in a movie called Dark Wolf. And I was playing the Dark Wolf, so I'm in a werewolf suit. And I run out and I jump on the hood of a car. And it starts going backwards about 20, 25 miles an hour. It's scooting along pretty good. And it does the reverse J. Like, remember when you were a kid you played Crack the Whip? Yeah. It was like that. It just snaps you off the car. And I went head first. And we had put up two uh, rows of oil Oreo barrels, 55 gallon drums. And they were too wide and too high. And I went in there head first. And when I hit in there, when you're doing a stunt, you're, you're flying, you needed to be air aware. You got to know where the ground is, right? Otherwise, you're going to do a face plant. And, you know, that's not going to be good. But as I flew in there, all these heavy barrels are flying around like bowling pins and hitting me. <laughs> And I mean, knocking me all over the place. And I'm looking up. I have no freaking idea where I am. I end <laughs> up, I hit, I hit my lower back on the edge of one of the barrels, the edges. And yeah. it threw me up in the air and I ended up landing on my face on the other side. But that was, uh, yeah, that was something, man. That was, that was one hell of a hit. What was really funny, uh, I'll tell you real quickly. Anytime you go out to do a stunt and if the cast and crew is there, you got a pretty good chance you're going to get hurt. Oh, because it's probably a dope ass stunt they all want to watch. Yeah, exactly. Matter of well, fact, let, me, so let nice. me ask you a question. When did they replace the, the, the those barrels with the cardboard boxes? Right, they went to the cardboard boxes. Was, well, was, were those safer or? Well, they, you know, cardboard boxes have been around forever, and, and just to give you an idea, they used they used to use them for falls, where you would you would put it together and you'd strap them up and you could fall and hit the box boxes. Right. And the way they found out about that was two guys, two stunt guys were going to, to the set and uh, there was a beer truck and this guy took out a, a small box, like two, two foot by two foot. And he reaches up and he grabs the uh, full thing of beer and lets mm -hmm. it drop and it drops onto the box, but doesn't crush it completely. And the Both guys are like, Hey, wait a minute. <laughs> it can that's, take that, it can take us. And that's how it actually got started. <laughs> Because I remember seeing all these huge stunts, and then there'd be like these th who sets up all those freaking boxes, dude? Thousands and thousands of boxes. And I mean, the, the, the cardboard industry must have been stoked. Well, I, I would think so because there's, the, <laughs> there's been a lot of boxes used in the uh, in the all the years of stunts. But now, before uh, we before we get into the ghost hunting thing, which is a big thing, I have one more question to ask you because again, I'm not the regular host. Is um, first of all, two parts question. The best car chase scene you've ever been into, as far as a stunt driver, and the best car chase scene you've ever seen in a movie. Well, I think the obvious one is Bullet. Oh, I know. I saw the French Connection the other day. French Connection is not bad, but Bullet is the first one that really made car chases famous. I was just arguing with my buddy. He said Bullet by fucking far. And what about the what about the race you've been in? Anybody? Well, in, I will any... tell you one that that Kane and I did together, uh, and it it was. At the same time, we had the girl up on the car, mm -hmm. but it was a different scene. And they had got a trolley, a camera, you know, 
was yeah. on the back of this this truck, and it could you know was it could lift up and down and everything else. And after we did the thing with the girl on the car, the director comes up and he goes, "Hey, we've got the the truck for about another half an hour. Can we do something?" And <laughs> Kane Kane was the coordinator. He goes, "Like what?" And he goes, "Well, can you guys like drag race and cut each other off and everything else?" Kane goes, "Okay." And we started walking away. I said, well, "What are you gonna do?" And he goes, "Yeah." We'll just, we'll just do it. And I'm like, oh, <laughs> great. Right. And he goes, no, I'll come up and I'll run next to you. And then I'll cut you off and you come up and you run next to me and then cut me off. Well, we're doing that. And I mean, we're flying along and I'm looking up and I have just cut off Kane and right. I'm, I'm in the right hand lane and Kane is way over the left hand in this Dodge Challenger. And I'm in a, a, a Mustang convertible. Right. And he's way off to the left. And I look up and we're getting awful close to this truck and the camera, which is down low. And here comes Kane, and he just comes flying in, and he goes right at the front tire of me. I mean, just right on an angle. And I see him, and I go, and I just jerk the car out of the way. And he goes flying past me, and all I hear is, and I look, and the, the, the camera truck had stopped, and Kane had slid, like this is the camera. Kane came sliding in, and just as he got to about here, the guy lifted up the camera and oh, came so. underneath the camera. That's that was what was that Roy Schneider in the French no, connection? No, that, right? that was no, but, no but I'm talking about the same stunt it, when oh. the truck maybe went right underneath the truck. Oh, they've that's that's been it done a lot of times. I know so that, guy, that uh, and you get paid to do that shit. You get paid to do that shit. Well, My yeah. girl was that drunk in her car every night from the way home from the bar. <laughs> Look who we got tonight. We have a foursome now. We're all packed. We got Chuck. Big Chuck. Hey, who's that guy? You? <laughs> he is the Casket Appalachian Research Collective's own stuntman right there. Yeah. <laughs> I, I fall out of cars. Yeah, see, he falls out of cars and he gets drunk all the time. Anyway, so listen, let's turn it over to Liz. Let's talk about some ghost shit. Let's go. Yeah, yeah I want to talk so, to the pretty one. You guys back off. Come I on. know, right? Oh, well, I guess yeah. we, we were just talking to Brendan. He's okay. the pretty one here, okay. right? <laughs> so, well, depends on how you look at it. <laughs> <laughs> so how did you get started in this whole ghost hunting thing? It, it kind of started me, actually. Okay. Um, my grandfather died in one of those um, gun cleaning accidents. Okay. And and uh, my mother didn't have a lot of money when we were growing up on the south side of Chicago, and I was 13. And my grandfather, who I barely knew, wanted to be buried in Paducah, Kentucky. So we put in, you know, got the casket, put it on, on a train, and we went from Chicago to Paducah on a train. And they took the thing off, took the body to the funeral home for the thing the next day. And my mother didn't have time to, you know, do anything, right? Mm -hmm. So we had no hotel room. We had nothing. So we just started walking from the funeral home trying to find a place to stay. And we saw mm -hmm. this two-story brownstone hotel with the neon flickering outside, you know, the, the one that they should have used for Psycho, oh right? <laughs> so we go in there and my mother says, uh, do you have a room? And he goes, yeah, we've got one left. And she goes, well, how much is it? Because money was a big, big thing at the time. And the guy told her, and she goes, oh, okay, uh, we'll take it. And the guy says, well, I have to tell you, that room is haunted. Now, I'm 13 years old. You know, my reaction, yes! <laughs> right? So anyway, we go up there, and it's shaped like a volleyball court. It's a big wooden floor. Okay. And it's probably 20, maybe a little bigger, a little wider. And there's a rollaway bed on each side. Mm -hmm. right? so this is not the Hilton, okay? <laughs> so we're... <laughs> We're over there, and we, we were really tired from all the traveling and the emotion and stuff. And we just, you know, fell asleep. And we were probably 15 feet apart. It was a good wide room. Mm -hmm. And I'm just about three quarters of the way asleep, and I hear my mother scream. So I sit up, and I look, and I see her bed is just going across the floor towards me. Mm -hmm. And then I realize that my bed is flying across the floor towards her. And we oh smacked, God. boom, right in the middle. And uh, we just sat there and looked at each other. And then my mother looks at me and she goes, I think that guy downstairs is right. Oh, no. So, so after that, you know, I was pretty much hooked. You know, I said, okay, there, there, that was no coincidence. We tried to debunk it by pushing the beds and everything mm -hmm. else. And, you know, we thought maybe that a truck came by and vibrations made it roll right. and the floors were warped. They weren't. We tried rolling things. Nothing mm -hmm. happened. 
So after that, I was like, man, I got to figure this shit out. <laughs> yeah, were they actually were the beds actually up in the air? Do you think, no, or were they no, just sliding around? No, no, they were, they, they were rolling. They're just... Okay. Wow. I know so that I've had this. Um, I used to go to University of Pittsburgh um, in Bradford, Pennsylvania, the ice bucket of Pennsylvania, right? And that place used to be an old airfield, and there were all sorts of fires and all sorts of people that supposedly died there. I didn't know this until many, many years later, but I would see fire coming out of my walls. I would, my bed, I would be lifted in my bed all the time in there. It was, it was nuts. <laughs> it was absolutely yeah. nuts. And that's why I asked that because I thought, you know, gosh, is that a thing where everybody's beds lift? I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I've never, I've never been in one that lifted, but I have been in ones that have bounced and, and slid yeah. and everything else, but never, never one that lifted. Wow. That, so did you guys pretty... stay there all night? Yeah. We okay. didn't have any money to go anywhere else. You know, so <laughs> <laughs> we were kind of stuck. So Right. Okay. So your yeah. mom was pretty cool with the whole ghost thing, or did she, like, encourage well, any of these things with you? Well, I'll tell you something funny. Um, well, it's not funny. My mother was passing away from cancer, and I went back to Chicago to take care of her. Mm -hmm. And she used to sleep in a recliner in our, in our house, and you could look all the way down to the back door. Went through the, the hallway, the kitchen, and then dining room, and then you can see the back door. And one day, you know, my mother looks up. She goes, "Oh, my Indian is back." And I went, "What?" She goes, "There's an Indian that comes and stands inside the door once in a while and looks at me." And I went, "Huh? How long has this been going on?" And she goes, "Pretty much the whole time we've lived here." I said, "And you've never thought to tell me that? You know, I'm kind of in ghost hunting, you know." Right. And, and she goes, and she looks at me and she goes, I've seen ghosts my entire life. Mm -hmm. We've never talked about it a single time. <laughs> not after that day that we had the thing. So, wow. But, but she just looked at me and says, I've seen ghosts my whole life. So, it's probably so normal to her, though, that she just never thought to mention it. Well, the fact is, she put up with me. So she, you know, <laughs> she, <laughs> ghost ain't going to bother her any. Oh. <laughs> I know we lived in this one house um, a couple of years ago and this guy would walk down the stairs and he'd stop at the bathroom door if I was doing my makeup in the bathroom with the door open and he'd stop and stare at me and I could tell he was a boxer. But my grandfather was a boxer. He's long past. It was not my grandfather. This guy was short and stocky. My grandfather was tall and skinny, but he would stand there and he was a boxer. Like he told me he was a boxer. Nobody else saw him, but he would walk up and down my stairs. I had to stop doing my makeup in the bathroom though. <laughs> I started doing it in the living room because I just thought, oh, why does this guy keep looking at me? <laughs> well, maybe he was guarding you from something. Maybe, maybe. <laughs> well, you got to ask yourself, why are they there? Right. Why you know? are they there? Well, you probably just wanted to see a pretty girl. Right? So, hey, wow. I don't know about that. <laughs> well, I bet you you're better looking than your brothers. <laughs> oh, I don't know. All my girlfriends have crushes on my brother. So um, I don't know. He might be the better looking one. We'll see. Maybe, but not to the boxer, though. <laughs> Maybe, that's true. <laughs> so um, what is the craziest place that you've ever investigated? Been in a lot of them, actually. I mean, I, you know, I've, I've been lucky enough to ghost hunt in Scotland extensively because mm -hmm. I go there for a month every single year except for the last three. So I'm, okay. I'm going next Saturday. I'm so dang excited. Yeah. I can barely, barely think. <laughs> but uh the, the absolute most haunted place I've ever been was in Yorkshire, England, in a place called Bol Bolton Priory. Okay. And what happened just before we went there, we went to Norwich Theater. And I was with a group called Anubis Paranormal, and some guys from Scottish, Brian Harley and Caroline Hosborough, uh, went with me. They they actually took me. And we went to this one, uh, there with a, they were with Premier Paranormal. And we joined up with Anubis, and they took us to this place called the Norwich Theater, which was an actual theater. It wasn't mm -hmm. like a movie theater. I think it probably could be, but it was more for, you know, the live theater. Right. And as we were going through there, a lot of people were seeing, you know, apparitions and stuff. I wasn't. And we went downstairs, and it was so weird because it was where they pulled the curtains, you know, like the ropes were there yeah. and everything else. Yeah. And they had, a, they had a pipe about this big around that went across the floor, not the floor, across the room. And you weren't supposed to go on that side because there was like the electricity, the pipe, you know, the ropes mm -hmm. and everything else. So I was standing next to the pipe 
the other people were behind me. And I looked next to me and somebody was standing there and they had like this, you know, it looked like they were looking at a, a phone or they're looking at a K2 meter. Right. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking, well, all right, which one of our knuckleheads went over the pipe and we're all going to get yelled at. Mm -hmm. And I looked back at the girl, Mandy Fellows from Anubis. Uh, she was a leader of Anubis. And just from the look on her face, I knew something was wrong. So I turned around, looked right back. Now, this guy had been, I could have tapped him on the head. That's how close he was, mm -hmm. right? But it, all he was was a dark shape because it was dark down there, right? Mm -hmm. And I looked at her and she just looked at me and I turned back. There's nobody there, right? And this had only been like five seconds, right? Mm -hmm. And she just looks at me. She goes, you saw him too, didn't you? I went, yeah, I did. So, but then we went to Bolton Priory. Wow. I mean, wow. It was just so crazy there. Uh, Carol Ann, one of the girls, I always wear black because, you know, just I'm a guy. I, you know, <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not much into fashion. So anyway, um, we were out at Bolton Priory, which is like a big, big uh, place where it was all religious. There had been churches and, and mm -hmm. inside the one church, there was no roof. And the whole floor it was grass. Now they would planted grass inside of it. And we had been told that there was witchcraft and satanic rituals done inside this thing up where the altar used to be. Well, they'd also brought two bouncers with them from Liverpool. And mm -hmm. I was ghost hunting with them. And we looked up and there were all of the other people were standing in a line facing one guy. Right. And then we saw a shadow figure go around the corner. So the three of us went after it. Right. Mm -hmm. And when we got around the corner, we heard all this yelling. So we came back and there's two people down on their knees and my friend Brian was flat on his back, totally out, right? So we grabbed him and we tossed him over the fence. You know, we took him over and, you know, I was, I was watching him. I used to be a lifeguard. You know, I do a lot of water safety for movies and stuff like that. So I'm watching him and I start seeing like the micro, micro tremor. So I know he's either uh, really cold or he's going into shock. So I told them, I said, let's let's put him on the ground and, and, you know, let's elevate his feet. So Mandy grabbed her two equipment cases. We put his feet up there and, you know, we kept trying to get him to come back to life. And he finally did. But one of the weirdest things was I asked each and every one of these five people what they saw. Mm -hmm. The one guy didn't see anything because he was the one that was talking to the other people. Uh, Carol Ann looked at me and she goes, I saw what looked like a, a goat's head with no eyes. So I asked the next guy and he goes, I didn't see anything because I was just kneeling down because the guy that was leading it wanted everybody to kneel. Mm -hmm. And then uh, the next person said, I saw what looked like a goat's head with no eyes. And then nobody had time to make up this story and nor would they, because I, I know these people, they're all right, above board. Right. And this, if they say that's what they saw, that's what they saw. But uh, I asked the next guy and this, this made the story all that more believable because I, he goes, I saw, you know, a ram's head. I think, but no eyes. Right? Wow. So that was, he didn't say exactly what they did, but it was right. close enough to similar. be mm -hmm. similar. Yeah. So we finally got um, Brian back to life. And uh, as we were walking him back, I asked him, I said, what happened? He goes, I don't know. I was there. Next thing I know, you're slapping me. <laughs> <laughs> so, so anyway, earlier in the day, we had um, Mandy and, Carol and I had walked back towards the car and there was a gate and Mandy tells us before we go through that they say that there's a curse. If the spirits don't want you to leave, you can't get through the gate. So Mandy, who's head of her own ghost hunting group, a very good ghost hunting group has had on a uh, necklace that was uh, blessed by the Vatican. Mm -hmm. And as she started walking, I was behind her and I saw the necklace go yank on her neck and actually leave a burn mark on her neck. So, and Carol Ann was right behind her, and then I was in the back. And I said, well, let's let's keep going. And she started to walk forward. She goes, wow, something doesn't want to let me go. I said, well, you're just going to have to push through it, right? Mm -hmm. So she goes, Arr! and off she goes, and she, she gets through. Well, Carol Ann had been a soldier, right? So she's no little daisy. Uh, you know, she'll, she'll rough you up if she has to. Uh, she starts walking, and she goes, oh, it doesn't want me to leave either. So she muscles up, and she goes through. I walk up there and it's like, yeah, get out. I didn't feel a thing. It's just, we don't want you anymore. Beat it. So I got outside and uh, another thing that happened there, that was so weird though, with the necklace and yeah. having a hard time getting through the gate. Um, Carol Ann 
comes walking out of the priory, and I'm out on the field out there with my K2 meter, right, in one of the old buildings just standing there. Mm-hmm. And she's out there, and she's talking, and she looks over, and she sees me, and she goes, ah, how long have you been out here? I said, 15, 20 minutes. She goes, I was just following you. I saw a large black shape in the in the dark. I thought it was you. I was following you. And now you're so she was a little Oh my you know, goodness. Yeah, she's like, I was I thought I was following you. But the weirdest thing of the whole night, we're leaving two in the morning, roughly, drive down the highway. Uh Gary Fields, who is a me, uh, medium, he used to have his own TV show in England. He's driving, I'm sitting next to him, and then uh Brian and Carol Ann are in the back. Nobody on the highway. Just we're just flying along, and all of a sudden, Carol Ann screams, right? And I'm trying to see what's going on, but I'm tall, and the, you know, we're in a Beamer, and I'm like, I can't see anything, right? Mm-hmm. And uh, all, all of a sudden, the car just swerves, like, you know. And I thought, oh shit, Gary fell asleep, right? So I look over at him, and he's going, prayers and light, prayers and light, not today, not today. And I'm like, what is going on? Right. Mm-hmm. So he swerves back the other way and he's in the far lane and they both just start. Blah, 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 blah. And what had happened was there was a young guy. There was a bridge we were coming to. He climbed to the outside of the bridge and he was getting ready to jump in front of our car as we were coming. He was going to kill himself. Oh, my and, gosh. Yeah. Wow. He would have killed us, too, from jumping off a bridge and us yeah. going 70 or whatever we were going. But just to show you the difference between England and here, Gary calls the police. Mm-hmm. And this lady goes, oh, hello, what can I do for you, love? I was like, boy, this isn't Chicago. <laughs> right? And she, he goes, well, there's, you know, somebody get ready to jump off the bridge. And she goes, oh, is that bridge number 12? And he goes, yeah. She goes, oh, we already have that. Thank you, darling, for calling in. I'm like, <laughs> like three ninety nine sex line, you know? <laughs> right. <laughs> what was so funny is the next day, the people that had followed us, the other part of the group had been about 15 minutes later, and they saw the cops grab the guy and drag him back in. So he, mm-hmm. he was okay. But weird, weird night. There's never been a night that was stranger than that. Wow. That's in my book, you know? Okay. Um, by the way, I have to brag. My book actually won the uh, Paranormal Awards Show Book of the Year. Very nice. Yes. I. What was so cool about it, I didn't even know it was up for an award or anything else like that. So I was like, oh, cool. <laughs> <laughs> So, so what do you think that that goat's head thing was? Do you do you think it was like some kind of demonic infestation, or what do you? The what thing you, that got Brian, that? you mean? Yeah, I think I think just the way they were talking, I think that there's that thing is always around on there, and I think okay. you know just seeing an opportunity, it made itself known. Okay. And, uh, yeah, very very strange. I mean. But I, I've been fortunate enough to, you know, hook up with the Scottish paranormal guys who mm-hmm. are part of the TV show now called Spook Scotland with Chris Fleming. Mm-hmm. And uh, I've gotten to go to so many great places in Scotland and all these castles. And I actually had what you guys will like for all you ghost hunters out there. A friend of mine was the uh, manager of the Real Mary King's Close, which okay. is like a, uh, an attraction, very famous attraction that has like almost you know, a city, but not near that big, but a lot of underground still rooms and Mm -hmm. and houses and stuff. And they're underground. You go down this big Mm -hmm. hill underground and we went in there to uh, ghost hunt one night and he had asked me, he says, Hey, why don't you get some of your friends and come ghost hunt this? And I said, for the price you charge me, no, he goes, I wouldn't charge you anything. And I said, see, see what kind of guy you are. (laughs) (laughs) I have a weird sense of humor, by the way. Yeah. I think you probably noticed by now. Yeah, I like it, though. It's good. <laughs> but anyway, we went in there, and I told these guys, I got some people from Anubis, Mandy Fellows and some of her gang, uh, Brian and Carol Ann, and then a couple of guys from, from Scottish Paranormal. And when they got there, I said, okay, guys, here's what we're doing. We're going to have a pair of unity hunt. And they said, okay. I said, no, here's the new rule. You don't get to ghost hunt with anybody on your team for the first half of the night. Okay. I said, you guys all ghost hunt with each other. You know, and we, I still get people. Matter of fact, today I got a, another note. Somebody saying that was one of the best nights we've ever had. I mean, we had all kinds of stuff going on and it was, it was really cool that everybody was working with other people. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? 
Yeah. And then at the end of the night, everybody was working with who they wanted to. And, you know, some of them were still hanging out with the other groups. It was, it was actually very cool. And to me, that's what paranormal should be about. You know, not, oh, this is my place. You can't come here. You know, yeah. <laughs> nonsense. <laughs> Turf wars, but paranormal version, right? Uh, you better not have a turf war with my group because we're going to win. <laughs> well, exactly. I'm sure. <laughs> hey, I want to jump in real quick because I think Gary Johnson is a friend of yours. Right? Uh, I, I recognize the name. Uh, so he's got a question here. It says, uh, somehow it's connected to Bigfoot and Bigfoot is possessed by it. Is he talking about paranormal stuff or do I you know? know what I, I don't really know what he's talking about. So you don't you don't know him personally? I don't think so. <laughs> oh, we'll take it back out. <laughs> I had a question for you. Um, of all the stuff that you're doing, I'm gonna just pop in, pop out because I'm like the the cuckoo clock there. Um, of all the stuff that you've done, you know, as far as um, you know, if you worked with a lot of groups, as far as the paranormal groups, I think you've worked with maybe, probably maybe the Ghost Adventurers and Zach Baggins and stuff like that. Um, Seeing both sides of Hollywood, as far as in front of the camera and behind it, do you think that the the the, Holly, the maybe sometimes the, the the TV shows are misleading when it comes to paranormal activity? Well, yeah, I do. Just to be honest, you are a TV show. Ratings matter, or you don't stay on TV. Uh, do I think people are just outright lying and things like that? No, no. Mm -hmm. And I can say for one thing for sure, my group was did a episode with ghost adventures guys uh, and kane and i are very wary of things and very concerned about our reputations mm -hmm. so we kept a really good eye on them and i can tell you they didn't they did not do a, anything that was well, to me they seem, yeah to me they seem like like i mean and this is at at our level here on the, on the viewer side of the screen they don't seem like they're one of those people that, that get out in front of the, 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 the bullshit. But yeah. it's nice to hear it from you guys that are back there because a lot of people won't tolerate that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's, there is. there is. There's a lot of people that... Um, see, what people don't know is what, when you're doing a show, there's producers there and they say, well, do you think we can do this? We can do that. And, I, and I'll tell you a story. We got a call to do a uh, TV show. They wanted to do a TV series about us. And uh, I went and I met this this uh, producer who had, trust me, he had the, uh, he could go like this and get a show on TV. That's how much clout this guy had. And as I was talking to him, finally he goes, well, what do we do, you know, if it gets a little slow? And I looked at him, I said, with myself, Kane, and R.A., <laughs> it's never going to get slow. Right. Because Kane's a huge prankster, and we always pick on R.A. R.A. is <laughs> like the size of Sasquatch, right? And, and. <laughs> Uh, we always tease him, but I just looked at this guy and I said, uh, what do you mean if things get slow, what can we do? And he goes, well, you know, I said, are you suggesting that we fake evidence? Mm -hmm. And he goes, well, you know, it is a TV show. And I just looked at him and I stood up and I went, thanks for stopping by and walked out. Yeah. You know, so, you know, anybody ever tells you that I was part of that, I wasn't. And I'll right. even tell you something that was a uh, famous line that I said on one of these shows. Somebody asked me, they said, what would you do if you found somebody faking evidence on a hunt you were on? I said, that's a simple answer. I said, we'd ghost hunt them the next time we went back there. Right. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, I know I did this. Uh, I did an episode of a show, and um, it's one of those ones where they have you, the real person, and then they have the reenactors, you know, one of those kind of shows. And they kept making me say a different version of what I saw. And I yeah, kept yeah. trying to talk really fast and sneak in what actually happened um, because yeah, I just wasn't comfortable with lying about, not lying, but telling a different version of, of what had actually happened. Well, I was on one of those shows. They actually had me on one, a story. It was like, it wasn't mysteries of the end of mystery of something. I can't remember what the name of it was. Mm -hmm. And, uh, after they did the show, they had somebody re recreate me. Now I'm six foot four. I'm in mm -hmm. 240 pounds. I'm in pretty good shape, right? Mm -hmm. And the guy that they had do me was five foot ten, <laughs> you know, <laughs> terrible shape, red hair, <laughs> you know. And I was like, this guy paid to be on this show. I mean, this guy, 
this guy looks nothing like me. And what's yeah. the stupidest thing is you got a guy who's an actor, so you're going to double him to do the acting. Now, right. That's not stupid. I don't know what is. <laughs> it was already there. All I had to do was tell my story and knuckleheads. Yeah. Yeah. It was, it's a very strange how they decided to put these sh some of these shows together. Yeah, but I, boy, if I found the guy who did the casting for that, I'm going to beat his ass. <laughs> a, a five foot ten chunky guy with red hair. It's supposed to be me. <laughs> <That's funny. laughs> so it kind of sounds to me like if I'm to take a wild guess here that you have, do you have any kind of like psychic ability or empathic ability or anything like that? Uh, yeah, actually, I'm very empathic, okay. which, is, which which happens to be, if you know the, the correct version, I'm sure you do. Most people don't of what an empath is. Mm -hmm. um, I'm very, first off, I'm very protective. Mm -hmm. I mean, if, even if people I don't know, if I see somebody pushing them around, I'll go get in the other guy's face. It's just yeah. that's my nature. Um, but I also pick up when somebody's having troubles, I have to fix it. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I spend more of my time wearing my own ass out, just laying in bed, worrying about a problem that's not even mine in the first place. Right. So being empathic can be a pretty tough road to hoe if you're actually, you know, really have it. Um, mm -hmm. Some people think if they just go, oh, you know, I feel this, you know, you have, you'll, you'll end up feeling everything and it, it can, it can wear on you. I mean, you, yeah. I find myself once in a while snapping at people because they're, you know, just enough, you know. Mm -hmm. Oh, I saw Cheryl Plum put in here. Cheryl Plum is actually a girl that uh, I just ghost hunted with. That uh, she's a friend of mine. Just mm -hmm. ghost hunted with her and uh, Mikey Thompson when we did the uh, live stream from uh, the Glen Tavern Inn, and we're actually leaving tomorrow. She's going. Her and Mikey are also going with me to uh, to uh, Old Paulding uh, Jail. Matter of fact, if anybody wants to go, they're still selling tickets. I think there's a few left. <laughs> And then they're also going to uh, Scotland with me. But um, Cheryl says, Rick is a magnet. Spirits are drawn to him. That's true. <laughs> well, you know, I'm sure funny. It is. I get my name called all the time. We get it mm -hmm. on tape all the time. And everybody says, why do they call your name and not mine? I said, because when I get in there, the first thing I do is introduce myself. I go, hi, I'm Rick. Mm -hmm. Right? And they know my name now. That's why I get my name called all the time. So <laughs> it's pretty simple. <laughs> <laughs> so do you want to tell us about the Glen Tavern hunt that you just did? Is there well, the Glen Tavern know? was pretty cool because uh, <laughs> actually Cheryl, Cheryl's a brave, a brave soul. Let's put it that way. There were two rooms up on the third floor. One was 306 where a cowboy was shot after he'd been caught cheating. <laughs> and in, in room 307, a, a, a prostitute had been murdered and beheaded and thrown into the closet. And that was the, that was the uh, room that she slept in. So Cheryl, Cheryl's got some nerve. But we were picking up all kinds of voice stuff. Matter of fact, thinking about voice stuff, Cheryl's like one of the best audio people you'll ever you'll ever run across. I mean, mm -hmm. she, she she can sit there and listen to the you know fourteen hours of stuff, and you know that she's really into that. So, um, but there were so many things that happened. I mean, we heard voices. We got voices on. Um, you know, on the recorder. And I can't say exactly what it said. I mean, I don't, because I don't know if you'll get banned for life or something. Uh, probably but, not. But I was teasing the ghost, not antagonizing him or anything. Mm -hmm. But I said, Calvin, are you in here? And we're here. Yeah. And I went, well, you're not going to do anything funny, like try and crawl and crawl in my bed while I'm sleeping or anything, are you? And he goes, no. Right. <laughs> and I said, well, I'm liking you better. And he goes, all right. And I went, oh, are you related to Matthew McConaughey? Because he goes, all right, all right, all right. And you know what it said? What? Fuck you. <laughs> <laughs> I got bitch slapped by a ghost. Oh, my gosh. That's great. <laughs> yeah, it was good. Yeah. I was listening, and I looked up. I said, did it just say what I thought they said? And they said, we didn't hear it. I said, play it back. And then they both went, you know. <laughs> I think that's probably one of the best stories of any audio I've ever heard. Yeah. It's, it's like, wow. <laughs> it's pretty rough there, Calvin. <laughs> but it was funny. We got no activity. Well, Cheryl did. She got some thumping from inside her uh, closet while she was asleep that she was listening okay. to the tape. She just got that. 
Yeah. And the other guy, Mikey Thompson, is like great with the gadgets, and he's a great ghost hunter. They're both really good. So um, always happy to have them around. All right. Uh, what kind of gadgets do you use when you go? Do, or do you have a certain one that you personally like to use, no, or do you I, just I go really in like, and use your head? No, I really like the K2 meter. Okay. Because I actually have gotten some really amazing things with it. I mean, when, I, when I'm when i at a convention or something, and I'll say, mm -hmm. you want to see something on a K2 meter? And they say, yeah. And then they'll watch it, and they'll go, holy crap. And I'll go, yeah, you can get stuff like that. I mean, it's... Yeah. Um, I mean, like there's there's two times in there where the the five lights all go up and they're still flickering, mm -hmm. and I go go back to one and instantly the boom go back down to one. Now you can say that well, there's something out there that maybe triggered you know uh, might be Wi-Fi made it go up. Well, right. what made it go down when I told it? Right. Lack of Wi-Fi. <laughs> right. <laughs> you know? But it was funny because both of them were instantly. I so said go back to one. Boom. So I mean it's. Uh, I also did something in one that was really kind of sneaky. I was down two floors underground in the travel lodge in Edinburgh. Mm -hmm. And my friend who was the head, guy at the desk kept telling me the place was haunted. So we went down there and I gave him the K2 to hold. And I'm asking, you know, things. And finally I, I said, uh, um, are there any other spirits down here? Boom, five lights. I said, okay, how about this? Light the lights up when I'm on the right number. And I said, are there two? And it went five lights. I saw Sorry, you looking I, out to the other side. I thought you wanted to somebody's coming into my building. Can you well keep going? I'm sorry. Well, go ahead. Be better better to be safe than sorry. I, I think it's just our studio owner. Hold on a second. Hello? Oh. That's where I jump in. Okay. <laughs> nice. There we go. So I think she's uh she works in a in a um aerobic studio. So I think she's back. I feel like the standby guy, like the fucking uh, woodpecker that just pops out of the cuckoo clock. Well, tell her to bring them good-looking aerobic girls in. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I told her. I said, listen, they can come by any time. Walk past the door anytime. All right. Where's the aerobic Sorry girls? Come on, bring that. them in here. We need some leotards in this show. Back, back to you, the originally scheduled program. <laughs> sorry about I am so sorry about that. I heard a noise, and I'm here by myself. And um, You got to go look. Yep. You got to go look. I, yeah, but it just startled me because at this time of day, nobody, all the shops are closed around here, and I'm the only one in the studio. So, um, well, I'm glad. So I apologize work. about that. So, where were we again? I'm so sorry. No, I was talking about being down down two floors below yes. the ground in, in uh, Edinburgh, and I had just asked. I said, "Are there any other spirits with us?" Right, and it goes five lights. I said, "All right, can you make the lights go off when I ask the number of how many other spirits there are?" And I go, two. And it goes, five lights. My friend looks at me and I go, three, four. And he's looking at me like, what? Right? It just went off at two. He didn't say anything. And I went, five. And it didn't go off. And I went, two. And went all five lights again. And he goes, oh. <laughs> right? I said, yes. So you got to gotta make sure you're getting the right answer here. Right. So, and then I asked if they'd been around in the 1900s and nothing. I said, how about the 1800s? And bam, five lights again. So you can get some pretty good, pretty good interaction with the K2 meter. I think the two that are the best for evidence, though, is the FLIR thermal image camera. Okay. Uh -huh. And I also think that the voice recorder, because those are two that you can continually look at and, you know, see things like okay. that. Uh, I'll tell you, I was in the Buffalo uh, Central Terminal. It's an old train station in Buffalo. Mm -hmm. And I'd been using my thermal imager and... I was going back over my uh, footage, and something kept, kept something was wrong. I kept looking. I'm seeing something here, but I don't see anything. So I finally went back, and I went like frame by frame. Mm -hmm. And in one frame, there's a man standing in it. Wow! Not in the one before, not not mm -hmm. anywhere before, not anywhere after. Just it's uh, yeah, that was pretty cool. But if I, I hadn't slowed it down and gone one frame at a time, I never would have seen him. So it takes forever to look at evidence, though, because you have to look for just that one tiny millisecond. <laughs> yeah. Well, I will tell you another story really quickly. Um, I was standing on Roslyn, the bridge at Roslyn uh, Castle and Roslyn Chapel. Mm -hmm. And it was like one in the morning. And I was there with some of the Anubis people. 
And this one guy, Gary Hughill, asked me, he goes, do you ever get any really good uh, EVPs? And I said, well, here's one. And it was from uh, we, the people up there call it the Houdini house, but it wasn't his house. He just had been mm -hmm. visiting there before. And uh, I go in and I set my K2 down and my recorder, my other, one of my other guys picks it up and starts going to the bathroom. And I went and sat down on this futon. And you hear my guy say, I'm going to get a base reading. And then you hear, no, which I always thought was real cool. And I played it for him. And he goes, that's the most amazing thing I've ever heard. And I went, the no, is pretty cool. And he goes, no, what it says right before that. And I went, what? What does it say right before that? Right? And he goes, listen real close. So I got my thing jammed in my head. And I can hear. <laughs> so I know that there's somebody saying something. Yeah. And I said, I've never heard that. I've played this a hundred times, right? And he goes, no. He says, do you want to know what it says? I said, yeah. So he told me. So I called up my friends from, uh, I was still in Scotland at the time. Obviously, he was next to Roslyn Chapel. Uh, and I asked the uh, Scottish paranormal guys if they could pull the, the audio up in that one section. And sure enough, it said exactly what he thought it said. And what, it, what you hear is, I'm going to get a bass reading. And then it goes, Get back here, punk. No. So that's kind of hard to figure out what that could be. But something yeah. did not like us. That's for damn sure. Wow. That's absolutely amazing. I mean, it, you know, every now and then we'll get something that, um, you know, sounds like just do it or I don't know, just something little. And but it's so hard to understand. And then it goes around the whole group. And nobody really knows for sure. So to hear something, you know, where you can hear it that clear is kind of amazing. Yeah, I had never heard it. I mean, all the times I played it because it was so faint. Yeah. But this guy just had really good ears for that kind of stuff. And yeah. when, I, when I had him pump it up, that's exactly what it says. And it's pretty clear. But I will tell you one, another one. I, I go to the birdcage down in Tombstone every once in a while. Mm -hmm. And I had ghost hunt. It was just me and the owner, which is really cool. And uh, I left my my uh, night vision camera downstairs in the poker room, left it running. And I got home about a year later. I found that footage and I started looking through it. And you hear me and Billy coming down the stairs. Now, I, I got to explain, before I went upstairs, there's been so many people killed in the poker room, right? Because mm -hmm. there was also, that's where the hookers were too, in the poker room mm -hmm. right next to it. And I said... Uh, did you die down here? Went up another stair. I said, did you kill somebody down here? And then I went up and I did ghost hunting all around the other place. When I came back, you can hear me and Billy walk down the steps. And just as we get to the bottom of the steps, you hear Billy talking. And then there's another voice pops in and it says, I had to. Oh, my God. He clears the bell. So I sent it to Billy because wow. I was doing another live stream down in Arizona. And I said, I'm going to go stay in Tombstone for a day. Mm -hmm. So I called up Billy. I said, Billy, I'm sending you a piece of film. Right. Mm -hmm. And he says back, he goes, wow. I said, get me in for a half an hour tonight. I want to see if I can get that guy to talk to me again. He goes, well, we're all booked up. He says, but you know what? Can you get here in, in like the next 15, 20 minutes? I said, well, I'm right on the outskirts. I said, I'll get there as fast as I can. He goes, yeah, I can get you 20 minutes to half an hour down there between the groups. So mm -hmm. I go down there at 38 seconds after I started, I got an answer. Can you believe that? 38 seconds. Wow. Yeah. I went down there. I said, last time I was here, I asked if, if you kill anybody and you answered me. Now, I just kind of want to know, did you see anybody else get killed? And he goes, yes. So there is somebody in the birdcage downstairs in the poker mm -hmm. room. If anybody's listening, he's talkative. Right, so. Wow, <laughs> that is really incredible. That's really, really incredible. Yeah, those are, those are two of the better ones that I have. So, what do you do when you're not ghost hunting? Uh, write other hobbies. <laughs> I, I write. I'm actually starting to write the uh, second ghost hunting book, which will okay. be finished probably in September after I come back and do write about all the stuff we did in. Scotland and about what happened at the Glen Tavern Inn and what happened at the LAPD Museum and what happened at Old Paulding Jail and what all the nice places, all the castles we went to. So that'll give me quite a quite a bunch of stuff to to write. It's about halfway done already. So just looking for some more pretty interesting, cool stuff. Right. Well, it sounds like amazing stuff happens to you all the time. So 
should be pretty you know easy what? for you. <laughs> Without sounding cocky, it really does. I mean, <laughs> things, I'm, I'll, t I'll tell you how my life is. This is just kind of strange. Things just seem to pop in. Mm -hmm. I, I have always been fascinated with Scotland because that is my heritage. That's where okay. my family's from. And I've always been fascinated with swords. Mm -hmm. So finally I said, you know, I want to get a, a broadsword like the Scotsman used, right? Mm -hmm. And I was looking online and they had one black poly pro, you know, hard plastic one for practicing. And I looked down, it was like $90 and I went, eh, right? So I thought, yeah, go get it. Don't get it. Go get it. Don't go get it. And then finally one day I said, you know what? I'm going to make one of those swords out of pipe, you know, just connect it together. You know, I'll have a sword. Walked out to go to, you know, the hardware store, threw my garbage away and looked down on the ground. And in front of the dumpster that was for the recycling was a brand new black polypro broadsword. Brand new, never used. <laughs> wow. And I'm like, thanks. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> but stuff like that happens to me all the time. And I mean, it's, oh my gosh. I mean, I was giving away my car, right? And mm -hmm. it had wheel locks on it, right? Because it had mag wheels on it and one of it stolen. So I called up Salvation Army and I was giving away my car and they were coming over in an hour or so. And I went, I know that I put the wheel lock thing in with the little toolkit, you know, for changing your tires. I said, but I better mm -hmm. make sure because if they get stuck and you can't take the tire off, what are you going to do? So I went down there and I opened up the toolkit. It's you know it just rolls out. It's very small. It's maybe only like as big as right here what my hands are, right? Mm -hmm. And there's like three or four tools in there. And I looked in there and I took everything out and it was you know the wheel lock wasn't in there. I, I padded the thing so it was absolutely flat and ran my hands across it. There's nothing in it, right? So I put the tools back in the three or four, you know, and I rolled it up and I put it back in the thing, and I started to walk away and I just looked up and I went. I can't give this car away and have people get stuck. You know, I could use some help on this, right? So I said, look again. So I went over and I opened it up, unrolled it. And not only was the wheel lock in there, it was sitting outside, just sitting in the middle, waiting for me to find it. Just So as I'm saying, stuff like that happens to me all the time. And I think I have somebody watching out for me. So that's that's pretty cool. Most definitely. I tell you what, this has been for a show that started out without a guest. <laughs> well, without, Rick, without well, let's, you let, let's get one thing straight before we go. The guest was sitting here at 10 to I'm 4. I'm not saying it was your fault. <laughs> I'm saying it was our fault. The ghost was sitting, the guest was here <laughs> sending you messages. I need a link. <laughs> and it's funny because she goes, Well, I, here's the email. I, go, I don't know. I, that's not my job because I'm the producer, right? And I do the Bigfoot shows and I do this stuff. But it, 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 I guess generally it's my fault. Um, but I go, You know, just in case I'll send a link on tonight's link. And then lo and behold, there it was. And it wasn't like he's in a 65 degree fucking temp air temperature room. He's it's sweating his ass off. No, it's 100 degrees in here. I've got a big fan right next to me. <laughs> the price and, you of know, fame. Usually Edinburgh's cooler this time of year. You know, <laughs> The price of fame, right? So I've got some questions. I, I, I mean, I'm not – so um, I'm more of the Bigfoot guy. So I'd like to ask you, Rick, have you ever been out on a Bigfoot investigation, and would you be interested in doing so? Yeah, I would, actually. Um, and actually, something happened on a movie I was doing. And I can't can't really say what it was. The NDA, um, right? You had to sign the NDA. Well, no, we were we were in uh, Northern California in the Redwood Forest, getting ready to do this movie called Love in the Time of Monsters. And there was a scene where the people were going to be in the rapids, you know, the, the shorter rapids, not you know one that were really deathifying or anything. Right. So me and one of the producers went over walking to find a place that they could get in, and it wouldn't be too dangerous with rocks underneath and stuff like that. And as we got there, it was probably 55 degrees out. It had been cold the whole time. We go out there, and there's just one place, and it's sand. It's probably five feet, you know, by maybe 10 feet this way, you know. And I said, this looks like a really good spot, the only good spot for them to get in and out of, right? So if we do it over here, this would be good. And we look down, and there's a, a foot, footprint in the, in the uh, sand, right? And it had been wet, so it was a very good footprint. But uh, it was a really big footprint. 
I wear a size 13 shoe. I was going to say, sport, you know, the, 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 the stunt guys got big feet. So, well, I get, I wear a size 13 and it was at least an inch, an inch and a half longer than my, the edge of my shoe, but it did not look like the classic footprint of a big foot. You know, the wide thing, it looked like a human foot that was that damn big. Right. But the thing is there was, cause it was like five feet. You would think there would be two steps in there. And it was heading towards the water. It did not come back out of there, which is really the only place to get out. So I don't know who this person with these, this giant foot walked into the water and never came out. So I, I don't know. But it, it was it looked like a human foot, but just really big. And there was nobody else. See, where we were at, we, there's nobody with us anywhere near for yeah. five miles either direction. And there's nobody playing out there in the water. I mean, it was just the guests of this hotel, and it was us making a movie. There were no other, no other guests. And there was nobody there at that time that had that size foot. So it was it was weird. Now, what would it take to terrify? I don't know if even if you could reach that threshold. But say let's say let's let's say you're in the woods with us, and hypothetically, we're in the woods. What would it take for you to go? I think I just pooped myself. Like you're you're kind of a tough guy, right? So you've seen a lot of shit. What would it take for you to go? I'm a little nervous in the service here. Would or uh, or would it take anything at all? You're like, you know what? I can handle anything, and I'm cool with that. Well, no, I can't handle anything. I can handle <laughs> most things, but I'm not going to be able well, to slug it out with a big foot. This, this is a tough chick. Really? I don't know. I'm pretty chicken shit. I can't even. I can't watch scary movies. I am such a wimp. You want to hear something talking funny? about? You can't even watch the movies you made before we I went know, on. You I, like, I can't bad. watch. I'm like I can't ask them about movies. I'm terrified. Well, I have to tell you something. I've done 30 horror movies. <laughs> exactly. I don't like horror movies. <laughs> oh my god! You're fucking so old school. You watch Little House on the Prairie or something like that, dude? On your day well, off? Let's see. I did when it was on. No, I did not watch Little House on the Prairie. No, I, it just really bothers me to see people getting hurt. I don't, I, I don't like it. And I, I got chainsawed in half through the crotch. You made your living doing that, movie, Rick. Right? You made your living doing that. Yeah, but that was that was make believe. A lot like my sex life. <laughs> so back to the question: What would it take for Rick McCallum to be in the the woods with friends? That maybe not us, but friends, and go. You know what? I think we got to go. And we're talking Bigfoot related. Well, I, I well with Bigfoot, I wouldn't leave because I don't think Bigfoot is dangerous. Because anything that big and has been out there that long, and wanted to hurt anybody, there'd be nobody left in the forest. You know what I mean? And the fact is, the slowest, easiest prey in the entire forest would be us. Oh, I thought you were going to say me. <laughs> you know what I mean? Uh, unless I saw him, and then I would not. I would no longer be the slowest uh, prey because <laughs> no, I'd be talking, looking out talking, of there. We're not talking a PC reply. Like let's let's say me and you in the woods, right? And we're we're filming Bigfoot. What what would it be at midnight or three o'clock in the morning? What would it be like? You know what? Would it be a sound? Or would it be a would it be a, a vision? Well, I think the thing that would get me the most is something ripping away at the tent that I'm sleeping in. <laughs> would would be it? Or if I heard a howl that was like right outside the tent? I think um, I would be right behind you. <laughs> you know, um, yeah. There's some sure. It, it's just like in ghost hunting. They say, "Are you ever scared ghost hunting?" I said, "No," but I've been startled a lot. Right, and that's isn't that why you're there? Yeah, right? exactly. You're there to that's be, why I'm there. there. I went out there, I bought all this equipment, I flew into this place or drove there, and now I'm there. And if it's, I see this all the time on the ghost shows. These people go to some place and there's a, a noise and they run away. It's like, dude, you just spent a thousand dollars to come here. You bought all this equipment. You get a boo and you ran. I mean, like, come on. This you know, is the that's Hollywood what I was ghost about. hunters. By the way, the Hollywood ghost hunters have only one rule. If you run, you're done. We throw you out. That's fair enough. Yeah, that is fair enough. Yeah. Yeah. If you run, you're done. Because I, I it, it's funny because we we, I, we with our Bigfoot group we feel the same. I've and I've been lucky. I've only been active with this for about three years, and I don't want to turn this into a Bigfoot show. But we've had the, we last weekend we had some shit that was funny. It was interesting, but it wasn't like you're gonna fucking run. And uh, about two years ago, it was me and Sean, who is the host, who wasn't feeling well tonight. It was like three o'clock in the morning. I'm like, wow, this is kind of like 
what the hell is that? Yeah, so so it's refreshing. You're not there to be stable, right? You're there to be a little bit shooken up. Mm -hmm. Whether it be ghost hunting or Bigfoot. That's part of the deal. I mean, you're a human being, you you yes. react. I mean, there's only one thing that 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 scares me, and that's girls. So um oh, you're not in the eighth grade, Rick. Come on. <laughs> And none of the girls that I'm interested in are in the eighth grade either, by the way. <laughs> so we have we have July 11th through the 19th in Scotland. You have a couple of tickets left, right? Correct on that uh, one. No, we're sold out for the for the tour. So besides that, what else do you have coming up, Rick? Because we're well, going to sign Paul, out here. Paulding, we had a great time. Old Paulding Jail is Saturday night, and I think they have a couple of tickets left. So if anybody is in the area of, of Paulding, Ohio. And they want to ghost hunt with little old me and some of my friends. It should be pretty interesting. Um, so get your butts out there and join us. Now, do you have what? What's your every every ghost hunter is busy during the holidays as far as Halloween. Do you have a big hunt coming up this Halloween? No, actually not. Um, truth be known, mo most of stunt guys and stuff hate Halloween. Now, you have to understand that I've played monsters. I've actually played a Bigfoot in a movie, okay? Um, the last thing we want to do is play dress-up. You know, it's like, you know, when you wait four hours having them pull the makeup off going, and alcohol, and, of course, I got to tell you, your face looks just ravishing the next day. I mean, they pulled off like four layers of skin. You're looking good, right? But, no, that's, that's uh, Halloween I just stay in. So uh, I was going to say it's it's funny because one of, one of the most active horror movie uh, characters is going to be home handing out trick uh, tr triscuits or not triscuits but uh, tick, uh kick cats. <laughs> yes, and on Halloween that's going to be you. No, actually I don't. I, I close my doors. I turn off oh, my lights Lord. and hide in the back room. No, <laughs> actually. Uh, so I, and I've lived here 30 years. One kid came to my door. And that kid had balls. because he's. I, I didn't answer the door because I didn't have any candy because nobody had ever come before. <laughs> so, uh, On that note, I'd like to personally thank you for coming out. Liz, you want to you wanna say thank you to... Thank you. Uh, yes, group? thank you so much, Rick. You are a pleasure to talk to. And I hope one day I get to meet you in real life and maybe do some of this stuff with you. Well, that would be fun. See, the, the problem with me taking my guys out, you know, uh, to, you know, find Sasquatch, half of us look like Sasquatch, you know, we, you know, anybody saw R.A. R.A. is six foot five and 340 pounds. Okay. Mm -hmm. There he is. <laughs> By the way, I don't know how much time you have, but I, R.A., like I said, is six, five and 340 pounds. He's real proud of how big he is. Mm -hmm. And I can turn him into Hulk Hogan just like this. I just walk up to him and I go, hey, R.A., you're looking pretty big there. What are you, about six foot two and 265 pounds? And you go, oh, well, 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 let me tell you something right now, brother. I'm six foot five and 340 pounds of coiled steel and sex appeal. And Kate will be standing there and he go, you just, you had sex with a banana peel. Well, well, that's not what I said. Like, <laughs> We, we terrorize that poor guy. Oh, my gosh. You guys sound like so much fun. Well, we figure we can outrun him. <laughs> <laughs> He's as big as a glacier, for goodness sake. <laughs> well, thank you again for being here. And this is my first time doing this without Sean. So I'm well, glad it was with you. <laughs> well, both of you did, the, did just great. Well, thank you. <laughs> you know, even though I was sitting here melting like a human. I, I almost I'm left. So I thought. Sorry. <laughs> no, I, I thought that what, what I actually thought was that I had talked to um, Sean, mm -hmm. and he said, yeah, it's seven. He said, it'll be four year time. And I wrote it on my calendar, and I thought, did I mess this up? And it's actually at seven. I said, well, I'm not just going to sit here in this hot room for three hours and hope, you know. So right. but we're finally able to hook up. So, Well, I'm glad. Thank you so much for everything. And, and you got to see Edinburgh. Yes. <laughs> that is what one country I have for? not been to yet. I've yeah, been, yeah. I grew up in Europe, actually. I grew up in Italy and I, you know, well, you been to a lot of places, but you never show seven. off. What's you're that? Big, you big show off. Yeah, right. You've been to more places than I've been. <laughs> well, I don't know. I didn't grow up in Europe. Well. <laughs> so, although I, I did take a girl to Switzerland on a first date. Which, wow. 
which made it real hard to come up with a good second date. So, uh, so yeah. well, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. I know you. I know you guys are closing up. So, I will thank you and say sayonara. Well, we'll see you around. I hope. I hope so. All right. Talk, thank you. Talk, talk to you later. Thanks, Rick. Hey, this is Chuck Larson. You're watching the CARC channel on YouTube. You've been watching Paranormal Files Into the Darkness, a Catskill Appalachian Research Collective production. For more information on this program and others like it, remember to like, share, and subscribe to CARC Universal today. To join the conversation on our Facebook group, become a member of the Catskill Appalachian Research Collective Facebook group. CARC.